from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. So today's session is on the Teaching the Civil Rights Act of 1964. Um, primary sources can engage students in developing a deeper understanding of the Civil Rights Act of 1964 and its historical context. Education experts, that's uh, Stacy Motes and Ann Savage, will guide you in considering audience, context, point of view when identifying primary sources to teach about the civil rights movement. So joining us, we have two very special guests. We have Stacy Motes. Um, Stacy, since joining the Library of Congress in January 2008, she has worked on various educational initiatives. She is the Education Specialist for the Library's Interpretive Programs Office, which develops on-site and online exhibitions showcasing the library's collections. She now manages all exhibition-related educational programming, including tours and public programs for visitors of all ages. Joining Stacy is Ann Savage. She is an educational research speci resource specialist at the Library of Congress, and she specializes in developing and delivering professional development content and materials for educators. A proponent of Project Zero's visible thinking, she has integrated thinking strategies into many of the library's primary source-based PD offerings. Before coming to the library in 2005, she was an elementary teacher and school-based technology specialist in Fairfax County, Virginia. So without further ado, I'd like to turn things over to Stacy Moat. Stacy. Well, it is really nice to uh, virtually meet all of you, and I just want to make sure to say that please, as we go through, I'll be asking for your um, feedback, of course, and please continue the conversation thread as we go through the various slides. I won't be able to comment, of course, on everything that uh, folks are putting in, but we will have time for question and answer at the end. Okay. So, you may be surprised to learn that the library develops exhibitions visited by more than one million people each year. I'd like you to imagine for a minute that you're planning to visit the library here in Washington, D.C., and just looking at this graphic and, and title for an exhibition, what would you expect to experience? And again, feel free to, to share your answers, your responses in the chat box, please. Photos, newspaper articles, videos, Tony says. Correspondence, demonstration posters, right, personal accounts. So all different kinds of primary sources. LBJ, speeches by LBJ. Any other individuals that come to mind? Bill Connor. Okay, well, I wanted to share with you a few photos that are taken directly inside the exhibition. And as you all picked up on on display, we have original primary sources that have witnessed history, whether it's manuscripts, photographs, music, film, and even a, a large 3D object. This is the actual flag flown by the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, or NAACP, as part of its 1920 anti-lynching campaign. And for this exhibition, library specialists carefully selected over 200 items and more than 70 audiovisual clips. And that sounds like a lot until you think about the fact that they were taking selections, these primary sources, from more than 158 million items in our collections. Um, in the NAACP collection alone, I believe there's over 3 million items, just to give you a sense of their project. <laughs> um, now, this page from the online version of the exhibition shows how, in the online version as well, they present the primary and secondary sources, that contextual information that goes with uh, these manuscripts and everything else. They present it chronologically in sections. And it surprises a lot of visitors that when they say a long struggle for freedom, they really mean the long struggle for freedom, starting with slavery in the 1600s and continuing all the way through to the impact of the act in the 1960s and beyond. 
And the selections for this exhibition really highlight the story not only of this landmark civil rights legislation, but also place it within a broader historical narrative. And as teachers, many way, in many ways, your process of selecting primary sources for use with students is similar to that of a specialist curating an exhibition for visitors. And I'd like to take just a moment to share what factors you consider when selecting primary sources, whether teaching about civil rights or any topic, really? OK, reading level. Anne says age of students. Right, whether or not the primary sources are engaging themselves. Practicality, Sarah says, good point. And again, feel free to continue responding to this question and, and going forward with the thread. But I'd just like to briefly consider four key factors. First, audience. For instance, is the content age appropriate? Would it draw my students in for closer examination, for questioning, further investigation? Context. Is there useful bibliographic information available, especially about the source or the publication date? And within the item itself, will my students be able to pick out contextual clues? Certainly, was it created during the time or topic under study? In other words, is it a primary source? Perspective. Certainly, will the students be able to identify perspective and also considering is the item's purpose or target audience easy to identify? And of course, we'd also probably want to think about things like, are other items available that represent multiple points of view for use with the item? Logistics, um, easy to, to skip over, but certainly important for us as teachers to think about. So for a photograph, how clear is the image? For a manuscript, will my students be able to read the text? And things like, certainly, the copyright, the right status. Am I able to print copies or display the item for use in my classroom? Even before we begin the selection process, though, for, for primary sources, whether, again, about civil rights or any topic, um, of course, we're going to think about our instructional use. And as a teacher, you may have an essential question for a unit in much the same way that a curator uses a big idea to connect everything in an exhibition. OK. So before we look at a primary source from the exhibition to start our practice of these selection factors, I just want to add one more really important consideration. When focusing on civil rights and addressing related issues like race and social justice, in, in my experience, it's, it's essential to reflect on your own identity. And so I've included a link here to the website of Teaching Tolerance, um, a project at the Southern Poverty Law Center. They offer many free resources for learning how to effectively approach self-reflective practice on identity. So I just wanted to include that since we won't have time to go in depth on that topic. Now let's go ahead and apply all of these considerations to uh, an imaginary teaching scenario. I'll give you some time to read this through. OK. And we're going to be considering an item from the Civil Rights Act of 1964 exhibition. And again, keep in mind that we're using this to introduce the unit, to spark interest, inspire student inquiry. And it's been decided that your students do not need prior knowledge. Okay, and I'm going to show the item and give you about 30 seconds to look closely.
Okay, and to help inform our selection process, certainly we would want to take a look at secondary information. And here you have the text label, the secondary source information that's displayed along with this photograph in the online version of the exhibition. So again, I'm going to give you a little time to read through this label text. Okay, and I wanted to point to as well that for this particular item in the online exhibition when you're, when you're live on the website and you click that link, it does take you to the item's bibliographic record. Not available for everything, but for this particular item it is, which is great because, you know, right there you have some important details also available to help with your selection process. So going back to our scenario and thinking about this for a seventh grade social studies class. Again, this is introducing the unit and thinking about our essential question. Would we use this particular primary source? Why or why not? And I would love to hear from all of you. Please type in your responses, your thoughts, thinking again about those factors of audience, of perspective, context, logistics. Here, yes, because it got me thinking about who flew that flag and why. Rob notes, they need to know what lynching means. There's no prior knowledge. Sarah writes, it's a powerful image. Students may be intrigued as to why, when, who, what. So again, which someone had mentioned earlier, this idea of a hook to draw students into this topic of civil rights for our unit. Mary notes that it is a simple statement, but still a question generator. OK, provocative image to generate questions. So I'm hearing from, from most folks that this sounds like, or this appears to be an item that you would consider using. Um, I can tell you that from taking students of different ages through the exhibition, um, I have the added benefit of having the flag itself, which is just enormous. It's, it's I believe, six feet by nine feet, um, and so kind of impossible to miss. And in many cases, I have the students, you know, especially since many don't have the prior knowledge, um, talk with me about what they think that term lynched means and, and kind of taking from their responses what they know and using that to guide my discussion with them depending on what's age appropriate. And also it's been a wonderful way to talk with students to make those connections that are so important to their own lives. Uh, some of the students will say, for instance, that um, you know they hadn't really thought about the fact that in this time period in American history, again, thinking about the historic context, that you know how else are they going to get the word out about um, about this violence and 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 how are they going to spread the word and making some comp interesting comparisons to what's happening in the news today and how people use social media for instance now to get their message out so and I see um, Rob has noticed a detail here about the juxtaposition of the American flag in the background. Okay, so let's let's practice the selection process again, but this time um, thinking about your own classroom. We'll still keep with the, the timing. This is going to be for an intro to a unit and our central question, how have groups and individuals advocated for their own freedom and equality? And again, thinking about whether you would use this primary source in your classroom and why or why not. 
Okay, so again, I'm going to give you some time here, about 30 seconds, to really look at this item. Okay, I'm going to now again give you the text information that goes with this. This is again the label, and in our online exhibition it's paired there with the item. So again, about 30 seconds just to go ahead and read this through. Okay, so again, reflecting on your own teaching, um, if you could share what you think about using this. Would you use it in your classroom? Why or why not? Rob comments that, yes, it covers her historical significance succinctly, also brings up the mass movement and role of churches. So expanding students' understanding from the beginning about the movement. Karen adds, yes, it shows the importance of religion and the power of women speaking out. Erin's noting that she's an identifiable figure, so it offers a connection for students. And I'd, I'd like to comment on that in that before entering the exhibition, much like I asked all of you to tell me what you expected to see in this Civil Rights Act of 1964 exhibition, a lot of students, when I ask what comes to mind when they think of civil rights, not surprisingly, you know, Rosa Parks, Dr. King, some of the more familiar figures come to mind. Um, however, what they know about them tends to be pretty limited in terms of, um, you know, not going deep into their commitment to advocacy or their personal lives. Okay, and I'm seeing many more wonderful comments here, questions about the fact that um, it would humanize Rosa Parks, that demonstrates her role as a public speaker, might be interesting to compare her to act activists today. I love good music. Yeah, that was, that's a great detail that you noticed there, and I'm going to forward ahead so we can go back to looking at the item itself. And again, Mary's comment about Rosa Parks um, and her long-term commitment to the civil rights movements, movement, not just, not just that one um, arrest that we, we think of, but truly this commitment to, to the movement and her role in it as a leader. Great. Thank you all for your, your comments. And again, I'd just like to return to my experience guiding visitors of all ages and backgrounds through this exhibition. And I chose these items for us to look at because they have both proven to be so extremely powerful in talking about not only the Civil Rights Act of 1964 and the many individuals and groups who contributed along the way to reach that, that landmark moment um, in U.S. civil rights legislation, um, but but it's just been um, really powerful to see how, for instance, the flag expands their understanding of the civil rights movement going back, you know, in this case with the flag, decades, but again, further in the exhibition, back to truly even before this country um, had begun. And then with one like this item, this flyer, just again, expanding on some of these more familiar figures and deepening our knowledge. 
So, just to reflect again on your own teaching, what kinds of resources do you use? What, what do you think would help your students develop a more complete understanding? Because, um, again, in this case, we were selecting primary sources that we would use just to introduce a unit, um, but certainly having that contextual information and having additional primary sources with um, multiple points of view that help explain some of that context are all valuable. And I just would love to hear from you about your own teaching. Anne writes oral histories, and in just a moment here, we'll show you how to find some of the other resources available from the library's website, but certainly the Civil Rights History Project uh, is a fantastic resource for oral histories relating to the Civil Rights Movement. Videos, Melissa notes videos that show the history. Deborah's talking about her love for teaching with primary sources, especially with objects and oral histories. Thank you, Deborah. Right. The music is, is also another fantastic connection. A lot of students, you know, depending on their own interests, whether it's uh, music or drawing, they get really pulled into some of the recordings available from the library's website, as well as um, some of the drafts, or, or um, whether it's of writing or incredible uh, political cartoons, for instance, that we have in the collections. Bonnie mentioned signs, and there is, in fact, um, a sign from the Jim Crow era that is in the exhibition and, and, again, available online. So as you hopefully explore later the exhibition and the many other exhibitions we have relating to this topic, you will come across some fantastic pieces. Okay, so because I know we're short on time, I'm going to just very briefly mention how to find the exhibitions from the Library of Congress because it is, um, to me, something really wonderful that the library does, which is to make our entire exhibition, you know, whether that's Civil Rights Act of 1964 or any of the other more than 100 that we have um, current and past exhibitions that are available, that go down to the object level online for everyone to use for free. So here's how you find it. From the main page, lsc.gov, you just type exhibitions into that search box. And when you're in your browser, if you continue there to this next page, it takes you to the search results, and you'll find Exhibitions Library of Congress. And when you click on that again in your browser, you'll come to this, loc.gov forward slash exhibits, which is the homepage for our exhibitions. And you'll see, again, current exhibitions are listed, including the Civil Rights Act of 1964. And to the left side, you'll see all exhibitions, as I mentioned, more than 100 that are available to us um, on any number of topics. Again, here is the homepage for the Civil Rights Act of 1964. And I just want to point very briefly to the Learn More page here, where we have brought together a variety of resources related to teaching about civil rights from the Library of Congress website. You see related exhibitions. And I just in particular want to point out this free idea book for educators. This was a collaboration between the Library of Congress and History. And it has not only unique primary sources from the library, but also many wonderful teaching ideas for how to talk about the different titles of the act and its importance to our history. So again, just to kind of wrap up my section before turning it over to Anne, I just want to mention um, again that when you are teaching about civil rights, it's so important to have not only the primary sources, but a lot of that um, background information, of course, like, you, like any, anything you're teaching about. And so to me, what is so wonderful about the online exhibitions is that the work has been done for you, and it has been done by experts from the Library of Congress. They've selected topics, um, again, from our millions of um, items in the collections, and they've paired them with expert commentary. So the research is there, ready for you and your students to use. OK. So I'm going to go. And uh, I just noticed a question here um, about URLs. And no, this is, these are online for perpetuity, essentially. So they, they have committed to having these um, exhibitions available and they live on past um, the time that they're here at the library. 
Okay, with that, I'm going to turn things over to Anne, and she's going to share some more resources from the library about civil rights. Okay, as Stacy said, I'm going to share with you several additional civil rights related resources that are available on the teachers page. I'm going to be stepping through the paths you can use later to get to each resource on your own, but at the very end of this session, we're also going to provide you a list of links to all of these Library of Congress resources. As you see these resources, as we flip through this um, brief tour that I'm going to give you, please go ahead and share any ideas you have in the chat box um, about how you might use them, whether you, if you see something you have used in your classroom, let us know, or perhaps some ideas or questions. So uh, keep the chat going, and let's start by showing you how to get to the teacher's page. Um, here's the library's home page. The easiest way to get to it is to scroll down if you need to and click on the link to teachers that you see circled. Once you go to the teachers page, one of the first things you're going to see is that up at the top, we have highlighted in our carousel of special things we want you to notice first, the idea book for educators that Stacy talked about. And this will take you to a downloadable online version of powerful resource, as Stacy said. Something else you're going to find on the teachers page is a link to our blog. And if you from this blog, you're going to find a number of resources related to civil rights. First of all, if you type in Civil Rights Act into the search box at the top, you will be able to find a number of blog posts about civil rights. The first one is shown here. This is one of several blog posts about the webinars that we had in partnership with Teaching Tolerance. Stacy mentioned this group. There are four webinars online for you to view. And they're all par uh, very powerful, again, with Teaching Tolerance, uh, part of the Southern Poverty Law Center. And you can listen to the recordings. Uh, secondly, you'll find a series of blog posts on the Civil, Right Act, Civil Rights Act. And this is a, I'm going to actually put a link here for you to this particular one, because this is the the main blog post that will point you to the other ones. And this will help you help your students immerse themselves in several important sections of the Civil Rights Act, where they can use primary sources to explore the aspects of life under legal segregation that the Act was meant to improve. For instance, voting, education, freedom to work, and one that students can really relate to, the right to go where you want. So check out these blog posts. Moving along. If you look up at the left-hand side, of there's a menu. And the next thing we will go to is classroom materials. <clears throat> and once you get click on classroom materials, you're going to find primary source sets. If you scroll down through this list of primary source sets, you will find two of special interest. And of course, uh, for those of you new to primary source sets, these are sets of primary so sources that we have pre-selected on many popular topics. They're ready for use by you and your students. Let's take a look at one of them, the NAACP, A Century in the Fight for Freedom. Here's where you can immerse your students in the story of America's oldest and largest civil rights organization, told through letters, photographs, maps, and more. Uh, first thing you'll notice at the top of the page is the teacher's guide written for you. And here's where you will find historic, historical context, 
and teaching suggestions related to the items below that are in the primary source set. You'll also see a link to analysis tool and teaching guides. I'll mention a little bit more about these in a moment. And then, of course, the primary sources themselves. So if you take a look, this just shows 10 out of the set. And for each one, we include a link to the item in the library's collections. We include a link to the bibliographic information. And also, for those items that are uh, visual items, we've created a printable PDF, an 8.5 by 11 size, so that you can use these items either on your computer, in the lab, or print them out if you need to, whatever your situation is in your classroom. You'll also want to check out our other primary source set that's related. And this is Jim Crow, which is also available in interactive ebook format. OK, let's go back to the teacher's page for just a moment. And if you notice, there's another link we'd like to share with you called Using Primary Sources. On this page, you will find a number of things up in the top. Why use primary sources, which is the page we're on now. Citing primary sources, copyright, finding primary sources, and then teacher's guides and analysis tool. Hi, this is Kathy. Anne's uh, experiencing some technical issues with her sound. So I'm going to step in here and show you around the teacher's guide and analysis tool. Um, here you'll see the, all these are hyperlinked as well. So if you click on the, on the screen, it will take you right to the teacher's guide. And we've developed these with subject matter experts from the library and talking um, in, in, in developing the teacher's guide. So it helps you with question prompts. As you're working with students with specific types of materials, you can use these to get students to observe, question, and reflect. Um, and next up, I want to share with you um, over on the uh, right side, you'll see uh, professional development. Um, in addition to webinars like we're doing today, we have done a series of webinars in the past. We also have online modules available um, that you can um, use on your own. We have uh, six different self-paced modules, as well as materials. All of our professional development material we release and make available um, online, so you can get to those materials through loc.gov teachers. Um, and then one other area that we want to make sure that you know about is Ask a Librarian. Um, this is a fabulous resource. It's on the top of every single page at loc.gov. And you'll see that it just highlighted at the top under Ask a Librarian. And I'm going to take you to that page. And um, here is where you can ask. Um, uh, reference librarians from around the institution uh, specific questions about resources that you might be searching for. There's an area specific for teachers, um, which you'll see highlighted on your screen, and it's resources for teachers. Um, so we encourage you to use these resources, um, and um, the, the expectation for the Ask a Librarian is that within five business days, you'll get a response. So the more specific you can be with information, especially if your students are, uh, are doing research, the more specific you can be in what you've been doing for searching and finding materials, um, the better off the, the, the librarians will be able to help you. So. Um, anyway, I'm going to, I'm going to click off uh, and, uh, sorry, I'm going <laughs> to, I'm going to move forward and see if you have any questions or comments. Um, we have about 10 minutes for question and answer. We have Anne, uh, we'll see how Anne's mic is doing, um, but we certainly have Stacy on the line. Um, so I do want to go back to, um, uh, one of the points, and this is something that I want to ask Stacy, um, because it was something that you all were, were chatting about earlier in the program, which is using these primary sources 
um, in stepping off on, on a unit or a lesson. And I wanted to see if Stacy had any further suggestions for us. My experience has just been that it just really opens up um, just a ton of, a lot of curiosity from the students because they immediately recognize that you know these these are the the actual um, pieces of history. These these are real people. So, for instance, um, when you talk about Jim Crow and you talk about this you know, legal separation of the races, you know, it's one thing to talk about it, but to see an actual sign that was posted outside of a restaurant, you know, that that reads, and this is in the exhibition: "No dogs, no Negroes, no Mexicans." You know, that is. That is powerful. That is something for them that, that just brings it home that we are talking about the lives of real people. And same with, um, you know, understanding that these are, again, people who are making difficult choices, not just once, but on a daily basis, you know, literally every moment of their lives in terms of um, becoming advocates for, for freedom and equality and justice. So, so John Lewis, I believe somebody had mentioned uh, John Lewis's name earlier in one of the chats. And we have two versions of the speech he gave as the youngest speaker at the March on Washington. And it just adds this human element to understanding that, you know, again, um, these are real people. So to see their, their typewritten notes with, you know, comments just, again, reinforces this understanding that, um, that it connects to their own lives and to what's happening in the world today. Thank you, Stacy. That's great. Um, one question that I would like to um, have you address is you work with the real materials in the exhibitions every single day, and you talked about the stories of students in interacting with the real materials. What about folks who um, can't always make it to Washington, D.C.? What advice do you have for them in looking at real objects? I am a, a big believer in pairing not only the, the digitized primary sources from the Library of Congress, but pairing that with, um, if you can, field trips to local museums and, and other cultural institutions in your area so that your students can appreciate the real stuff. Um, because it's just, in our, in our digital culture, you know, especially for, for some of our younger folks, it's sometimes hard to understand that, that you know, we have these originals that we have to preserve and, and take care of and, and you know, collect so that future generations will have them. And they, you know, for them to think about how to go out into their own communities and you know, perhaps interview some folks who have lived through um, experiences in, in their communities, uh, you know, whether civil rights or whatever the topic may be, but, but capturing that history and capturing their own experiences, whether it's through journaling or, or you know, even uh, filming a video or something like that, but, but that these materials are so precious because they are our shared history. Great, thank you. Um, Anne, I have a question uh, from Nancy. Um, do you have any tips for printing resources? Um, yes, uh, first of all, if the item is something that's in a primary source set. It will be easy for you to print if you just click on the PDF version of it. So take a look at those first. And secondly, it, you may just find that if you can go to an item, if you're looking at an item in the collection, to enlarge it and try right clicking on the enlarged version of the item and often your computer will have a software that will help you step through printing that out. And if I could add in um, for the exhibitions, the online exhibitions, when you go to the object level and click on the item, you know, whether it's a page from, um, um, you know, if it's a manuscript or if it's a photograph, uh, it will enlarge, and then at the bottom of the enlargement, there is a print button, and you can just print it from there. 
Terrific. Thank you. And Nancy thanks you as well. Um, and I have a question. Uh, perhaps you can uh, talk to folks a little bit more about the work that you did with Teaching Tolerance. Um, you and Stacy, as a matter of fact, did with Teaching Tolerance um, in your four-part webinar series. Uh, certainly. And as I said earlier, I would recommend you listening to some of those webinars. I think the, the most important thing for me personally uh, in terms of working with teachers and students was working with the kits that the Teaching Tolerance has put together for teachers and learning about um, suggested ways. For instance, they have five suggested ways of teaching civil rights. And they're all practical. They're all and they're all realistic. And they encourage you to help the conversation happen and, and, and find ways to help students feel safe enough to talk about what's happening. Uh, there's also a wonderful section on teaching tolerance about nine essential areas. Again, a way to help you think about what are the kinds of questions I want to be asking? What are the kinds of what are the areas I want to be sure to cover so that I help students see the complexity of the story. And that might be the thing I would end, end my comment with, is that I learned through teaching tolerance the importance of telling a complex story. Terrific. Thank you, Anne. Stacy, we have a question. Um, have you seen any emotional reactions from kids or adults as they go through the exhibit? Oh, absolutely. Uh, it's, it's, again, just, um, it's kind of in, incredible, the connection between some of these historic objects and, and what's happening today. And um, there was, in particular, well, of course, the flag, but, but in particular, there was um, a, a group we had that came through. And it was the day after the shooting um, at the church. Um, and you know, in which nine people were, were killed. And in one of the cases is an incredible print of the founders of that same church. And to s encounter that in this section that's, you know, speaking to the, the early history of, of the civil rights movement, you know, really the, the, the roots of, of this long struggle um, just brought people to tears. And, you know, again, it's, um, really powerful to see how people respond to the different objects and um, how, it, how it sparks conversations. Terrific. I want to personally thank Stacy and Anne for their pre presentations today. You guys did a great job. And I want to thank all of you, um, the audience, in sticking with us uh, through some of the technical issues that we faced. Um, but uh, there is no better audience than an audience full of educators. So we thank you very much. And we welcome um, your feedback at the survey. And I'm going to uh, end the recording and end the meeting. Thank you very much. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.